Okay, welcome to everybody. So that's the first uh, keynote speech of the inaugural conference of uh, the Julius Rabinowitz Center, and welcome to all of you. And I have the task to introduce Paul Krugman. That's actually not an easy task because everybody knows him. And if you check his blog, you can even read what he ate for breakfast. Uh, so I thought I would tell you when I saw Paul the first time in my life, I was an undergraduate student. I went to the AEA meetings in order to see all these famous economists. And then he gave a talk on geography. And suddenly the mic didn't work. So he was knocking on the mic and it didn't work. And uh, he made the announcement, somebody smarter than him should come to fix it. And this was not so smart because nobody dared to come. <laughs> Luckily, somebody actually from the back could fix it without coming in front of uh, to the podium. <laughs> so uh, you will expect a lot, and I think you will also see a lot. I think you see more than just blaming decrees for uh, you know having not so good politicians or blaming the Germans for being very efficient or frugal. Um, so let's uh, applause and uh, wait for Paul's insights. Wow. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks for, all for coming and, and, uh, and uh, let, let's uh, celebrate the opening of the new center. And the uh, uh, and the good t good topic for for an opening uh, set of meetings because boy um, so it, it's it as you all know it, it's it's a pretty terrible world out there uh, it's actually it's been it, inconceivable I think if you had said in uh, in 2006 uh, that that we would be where we are now uh, very few people would have believed you even even those of us who were reasonably uh, pessimistic who are worried about the housing bubble who um, and even those of, even even Euroskeptics who had some doubts about the the wisdom of the, the single currency nobody predicted that or, uh, that that it would be as as difficult as it is uh, right now um, and it's 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 a broad crisis it's a it's a North Atlantic crisis I like to say that's more or less equivalent uh, um, shocks on both sides, and, and in many ways similar shocks on both sides of the Atlantic, with a lot of equivalencies. It's actually almost eerie if you look at um, if you look at everything except the scenery. Um, Ireland and Nevada are almost twins. They are, they look exactly the same by the numbers. Uh, not not if you look out your window, but otherwise they look almost exactly the same. Um, but um, at this point, it's really clear that Europe is the is is the the more difficult crisis. Um, it's a, um, the United States, we don't know whether we're on the mend. There are some hints that we are. But the US doesn't seem to have a, um, a, an ongoing process of unraveling. We may be slowly healing. But Europe is, is a, a very, very uh, severe problem. And it's one that is heartbreaking, if you like, both in human terms and and intellectually, because it's I, I think one of the things that one really didn't under that I couldn't have anticipated or, or certainly didn't anticipate was just how um, how wrongheaded the discussion of policy would be in this crisis and the, the the sheer doggedness with which people cling to to views of what the problem is that are manifestly not true and that's true on both sides of the Atlantic again but it's maybe most striking in in, in the European case which makes things even that's layered on top of an inherently very difficult situation it turns out as I'll, I hope I'll explain a little bit that the the euro uh, the single currency uh, with which was created without many of the preconditions to make a single currency workable has turned into a into a trap that even with the best of of uh, of, of will and even with with clarity of thought would be difficult to escape but of course the the best of will and clarity of thought hasn't been particularly available either so uh, so it's it's a very difficult situation so when I was asked to do this talk I, the title I came up with re reflected something that I didn't think was being sufficiently appreciated and it originally came out of um, uh, some of you may know that the, the economic historians have been the best and have been the people coming off best in this in these terrible few years uh, because they're the ones who look at, at, at 
at the past, and it turns out that, that there are repetitive patterns, and the comparisons have been uh, really useful and, and I think have been your best guide to what will happen next. Um, and so Barry Eichengreen and Kevin O'Rourke did a, a very, very, very widely read paper in the heat of the crisis um, where they pointed out that the first year of this crisis was actually more or less as bad as the first year of the Great Depression, uh, which came as a shock to people here because we think of it from an American perspective where we had a very, very bad Great Depression um, and it wasn't as nearly as bad this time around, but other parts of the world didn't suffer as badly in the Great Depression, but this time we're fully sharing in, in, in the burden, and that included Europe. Update that to right now, and clearly the United States has done a lot. It's not good by any means, but it's, it's no Great Depression. Um, Europe, on the other hand, has done worse in a number of dimensions than the U.S., and is not that far from replicating uh, the troubles it had in the 1930s. It's, the, uh, it's not quite as bad, but it's, it's pretty bad. And on top of that, the theme that I, I've already kind of introduced um, ha is, is replicating many of, the, many of the mistakes of the 1930s. It's quite, quite extraordinary how, 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 how little we seem to have learned over these, uh, these past 80 years. So um, just a little bit on the, on the, the reality. So, um, uh, we don't have particularly good national accounts data, though we have some guesstimates. Uh, we do have industrial production data. Um, and so I'm, I've taken the League of Nations data, that's the, the blue line, uh, for, for Europe. And I've taken the um, Eurostat data on industrial production. And um, okay, we're not as far down, uh, never got as far down as, it, as, as in uh, in, in uh, 1933, last time around, but not as much better as you might think, and of course with Europe stuttering now, um, the, the differences are not so large. It's, this is, um, the U.S. Would, would be a more dramatic decline in, in the Great Depression, but this time around in Europe is, as I say, it, it's, not, it, it's not that far short of being a, a hit to production that is comparable to that of, of the Great Depression. Varies across countries. Germany had a very terrible 1930s and has not, of course, had that this time. The UK had a relatively good 1930s and is actually, the, US, the UK is, is clearly doing worse um, in, in output than it did in the corresponding period of the Great Depression. Um, GDP numbers. So I, this is just, a, I know that's presumably, oh, Nice big screen, so it's not as unreadable as I would have expected. Um, these are, for those of you who are into these things, these are the Madison numbers on GDP, which are intelligent guesses, but of course they didn't actually maintain national accounts then, so it's, uh, it's, it's not to be taken too seriously. Um, and uh, again, Eurostat, and I put them on the same scale so that you get some sense. And we are having a significant number of Great Depression level slumps in Europe. Not everybody, obviously not Germany. France is not having a Great Depression. The UK, for all of its problems, is not having a Great Depression. Um, but uh, Spain, uh, uh, hard to read some of my own writing, but Ireland is, is a full Great Depression level slump. Um, Greece, um, Latvia. Um, and unemployment rates, again, uh, problems of comparability, but with, with now 24% uh, unemployment in Spain and 50.5% uh, among, uh, among 25 and under. Uh, that is, that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a recession. That's not a, a, a somewhat difficult time. That's actual full out um, economic catastrophe. Um, so how, you know, this wasn't supposed to happen in the modern world, right? Because this is not, um, we knew that stagflation was a problem. We knew that, uh, that if you were faced with major supply shocks, that, uh, that there, were, there aren't any very good policy options. But this is pretty clearly, it's a demand shock. Whoops, sorry. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not really a, this, this is the kind of thing that was supposed to be uh, manageable. We're supposed to know how to use fiscal and monetary policy to, uh, to ensure that, that severe slumps don't happen. Um, and, um, but that has turned out not to be true. Not true even here, 
but very definitely not true in Europe. Um, and um, uh, worse than that, if you actually look at the policies that have been followed in much of Europe, they are not so different from the policies that were followed in the 1930s. Uh, if, you, if you like, the, uh, the single currency has come to play much the role that the gold standard did in the 1930s, where the defense of that standard has essentially blockaded any of the use of the normal tools of macroeconomic policy, um, where concerns about deficits in a world where countries are trying to defend their parity uh, have led to, um, uh, to fiscal policy uh, reinforcing rather than, than fighting the slump. Uh, very, very, it, it, sometimes you read the headlines and you say, wait, what year is this? Are, are we, uh, wh why does it sound so much like 1932, where, given all that we're supposed to have learned in the time um, that's passed? What I just said, uh, oh, um, the, the uh, question, if I sound like I've, Spent the last two nights sleeping on airplanes. That's because I did. So if I occasionally I may stumble over words. Um, the um, I haven't said a word yet about the narrative that has dominated a lot of discussion in Europe, and I think maybe that's the the entry point I should be choosing. So if if you read a characteristic discussion um, uh, at the at the European Commission, or if you read. I have to say, very many newspaper reports. Um, you will get a story which says, well, this is, this is basically, this is a story about countries that live beyond their means. And in particular, it's a story about governments that live beyond their means. And so you have a, you'll see a, again and again the, the story that it's about fiscal profligacy and the, and the crisis we have now is, uh, is the result of, of irresponsible fiscal policies in the past. Um, this is often stated not as a hypothesis even, but simply as a fact. So um, in a, uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, I read a, a newspaper report in a uh, prestigious newspaper, um, which happens to also employ me, uh, that, that said that, uh, that, that, the, uh, that failure to, to keep careful tabs on fiscal policy is what led to the crisis in Europe which is a fairly bizarre statement. Uh, it's not, it's arguably a story about Greece, although even Greece I think is more complicated. But the, the Hellenization of our discourse, uh, the way that we've, we've made everything be a, be, a, be a Greek story, has been a, a tremendously misleading um, uh, part, of, part of the way we've dealt with this crisis. Um, the quintessential Euro crisis country and now, in fact, the epicenter of the crisis, as it really should have been all along, is Spain. Um, and the, the story about Spain is definitely not uh, fiscal profligacy. So on the eve of the crisis, uh, Spain had a budget surplus, larger than Germany's budget surplus. Um, it had a level of public debt as a share of GDP that was about half of Germany's. By all, to all appearances, Spain was a, um, uh, actually a paragon of fiscal responsibility um, and was, was viewed as such at the time. If you go back and look, um, uh, Martin Wolf has gone through some of this, the, the, the IMF believed that, that Spain had a structural budget surplus. It did not believe that, it was, it was, uh, that this was artificial. Um, if you, um, Spanish bank regulation was, was widely praised. Actually, at this point still, I, I have my checking account at Sovereign, and the, um, it, the, if you call up the telephone bank, it still, it still boasts part of Santander, one of the world's uh, strongest banks. So they're saying, trust us, we're not American, we're actually Spanish. Uh, so the, there's the, but the general picture was one where it was widely regarded as a, um, as a solid economy. Not everyone saw that. Not, not everyone agreed. Um, and I actually mean to check this out in, I think, 06. There was a conference in Barcelona uh, where uh, um, a economist by the name of Olivier Blanchard uh, talked to the, tried to tell the Spaniards that, that, that he was very concerned about their large current account deficits and their housing, housing boom, and he didn't think it was a solid situation. But he was dismissed. What, what did he know? No idea. So it turns out that, that uh, no, one, no one really saw it. Okay. So it wasn't actually 
Um, Spain certainly was not a story of fiscal profligacy. Um, the rest, okay, um, Ireland looks like Spain in this, in this respect. Um, Italy is complicated. Italy has actually ran relatively small deficits in, in recent years, but it has a large overhang of debt from, from past irresponsibility. Um, and Portugal is, um, is Spain with a slight Greek accent, I guess, if you wanted to look at the numbers. It's, uh, but, but, but Spain is, is the epicenter, and it's clearly, it's not that, that story at all. So what, what actually did happen? Um, look across the board, um, you see that, so now I'm just looking at the average deficits, budget deficits over the, uh, um, the, uh, the period from 1999 to 2007. I start with 99 for a reason, because that's the creation of the euro, and 2007, of course, is the last pre-crisis year. Uh, red are countries that are generally seen as being in crisis now. Um, as you see, uh, Spain, slight surpluses, uh, Italy deficits, but not huge. Greece is, is very way out there, uh, but you would not have, have looking, if, if, even in retrospect, the budget deficits don't predict the crisis. Uh, what does predict it pretty well um, is balance of payments. Um, very large current account deficits in, uh, um, in, in uh, some European countries. Um, Estonia is not part of our usual group, but has in fact had a very severe slump without ever having had really a fiscal issue. Um, and uh, I have no idea what's going on in the Slovak Republic, but uh, wh whatever. Um, but otherwise, it, 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 picks, it picks out your crisis countries pretty well. And, uh, and that's clearly, clear. so I think actually we are, many people are now coming to the understanding that this is, is ultimately a, a uh, um, a balance of payments related story. Um, but how can that be? We were supposed to, it was supposed to be the case that uh, you weren't going to have balance of payments problems, right? Because you had a single currency. Payments in what? It's all euros. We weren't supposed to be at all at, all at risk. Um, but in retrospect, it's, it's horribly clear. Um, if I can say, the one thing about this crisis in Europe is it's the combination of um, uh, horrible, uh, horrifying human and political implications, as well as, as economic, and gratifying clarity uh, in terms of the story. I, it's, uh, it's, 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 it, it's one of the clearer stories out there that, in terms of, of, of what went wrong. Um, there we go. So um, I found out that there's no safe acronym for, uh, for uh, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. I, I put this one because uh, everyone likes the pigs and I thought, well, I'd be nicer. And then I got accused of being a racist for using this one. I don't quite understand. Uh, but um, so these, these are current account imbalances as a, as a share of, of the Euro area's GDP. And um, so I say Hans Werner Zins here. Germany in, in the late 90s was actually a, a, a rather troubled, depressed economy. Um, but uh, um, the, the creation of the euro solved that problem while creating uh, a much bigger one down the road. Um, basically, markets, uh, investors came to believe that if you were a eurozone country, you were safe. No problem with your, your bonds. What could go wrong? And so um, what had in the past been large differentials in interest rates between Greece and even Spain um, and Germany uh, on the other side uh, collapsed. Uh, there were occasionally actually uh, Irish 10-year bond rates were slightly below German, but in any case, essentially no difference, essentially a, a convergence, which meant a, a sharp fall in interest rates in, in Southern Europe, um, which unleashed large capital inflows uh, uh, large housing bubbles um, and uh, very large flows of, of, of money from north to south. Um, felt good as long as it lasted. Felt it, they were uh, rapid, rapid economic growth in the, in the countries that were receiving large capital inflows. Um, felt uh, helpful for, helpful for um, 
for Germany as well, because it was on the other side and, and, and its relatively weak domestic demand was more than made up for by a, by a surge in intra-European exports. <clears throat> and then, um, well, the side consequence of all this was that you had relatively full employment economies. Um, always some problems about measurement. So Spain had 8% unemployment, but it felt like full employment and presumably was in, in, in any real sense, um, which led to higher rates of inflation in the southern European zone. And um, use different measures, and people can fight about the various measures. Uh, but uh, a cumulative process. Now, the Eurozone as a whole, of course, is in between uh, the Eurozone average, which actually turns out to almost exactly be France, uh, is somewhere in between. So the, the, the apparent overvaluation of the, of the gypsy economies doesn't look as bad um, if you compare it with the Eurozone or compare it with France, but, but clearly a massive divergence. And I wouldn't stress, there, there's a kind of industry of, of trying to get different measures and what is the exact right measure of overvaluation. Uh, I don't think... I don't think you want to get too far into that. We, um, I, I think you want to assess it on a, on a PPE basis, um, which is proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, that the reality clearly is that, that Southern Europe got priced out, that they got to a situation where their manufacturing was uncompetitive because, hey, money was pouring in to support construction booms, uh, uh, consumer spending booms, and, uh, um, okay, all, all good. Now, um, if we had balance of payments data uh, within the United States, you would probably have seen something not too different. You probably would have seen that the, uh, um, I gather, the, some, some people now like to call it the sand states. Uh, it's basically Florida, California, Nevada, uh, uh, Arizona, um, would have been receiving large capital inflows from, from, uh, uh, from the Midwest. And, uh, and there would have been, I, our, there, there was somewhat faster inflation in those regions. There was, uh, in a way, it, it, it was probably true that Florida got somewhat overvalued during the, over the same period. Um, but I think not, a couple of things going on there. Uh, one, it wasn't quite as extreme. Uh, the, because you had a general complacency, um, a, a general runaway uh, uh, neglect, neglect of risks. This is the, the best economics title of certainly of the decade and maybe of, uh, maybe of the generation is, uh, is Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt's book, This Time is Different, uh, because the point is it never is, but, ever, it, but people always think it is. And so the, the neglect of past risks of, of leverage was, was, uh, was widespread across the advanced world. Um, but um, in, in Europe, you had the additional false security that came from the single currency. Um, and, uh, and then the music stopped. What happens at that point? There are, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say one other thing about the U.S. versus Europe. Um, to some extent, although it's, it's proving, I've been trying to put this together numerically, but um, it's a little elusive, but it, uh, mobility of labor must have at least to some extent helped cushion it here, that you had the booming regions and people moved there. Um, and uh, and that get that will get me in a, in a moment to um, uh, to to some uh, underlying analytic issues that I think have we've, we've learned a lot about. Um, okay, the end came. Uh, the, the the bubbles burst. Uh, the capital flows, at least the private capital flows, dried up, and suddenly you have a, a crisis within the euro area. Um, what do we, uh, what, 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 what's supposed to happen at this point? Well, if this were, the, the problem is, is not simply that Southern Europe was overspending, because, uh, although it was, though at, at least initially not the public sector, the private sector was spending beyond its means, as it turned out. That wasn't obvious in 2006, but it was obvious by, by 2010 that that had happened. Um, but in pulling back, um, the problem is that it, it's a collapse of these foreign capital finance spending that has been sustaining the economy. Um, but there's no 
simple mechanism by which something can take its place. Uh, what you really need, this is all very basic, standard, old-fashioned international macro, you need some expenditure switching to, uh, to compensate for the expenditure reduction. You need, um, Spain needs to export more manufactured goods to make up for the uh, large decline in construction employment. Uh, but that's how, what's going to make that happen. What's the incentive? What's, what's going to change the incentives and, and, make, uh, um, and make Spain an attractive place to, to move a lot of manufacturing? Well, it has to be a fall in relative costs, relative prices, um, which if Spain still had its own currency, would be most easily accomplished by simply um, devaluing. Um, but it didn't have its own currency. And you're left with, uh, the, with the necessity of trying to make that adjustment in some other way, um, which um, is um, basically it has to have a, a, not, not a, an adjustment, a one-time adjustment through a currency change, but uh, uh, an ongoing adjustment by actually uh, either cutting or at least having wages fail to rise as rapidly as in, as in the, the surplus countries. Uh, so Europe was left with the necessity, if it's going to make this thing work, of having a process of internal devaluation. It's uh, one of those horrible jargon phrases that I think is, it confuses people. But the notion was that you'd have internal devaluation. Uh, and that's still the hope. If, if this is going to work at all, if the Eurozone is going to survive, it's going to have to involve a, a large fall in the relative cost of labor. In the, uh, in, in the peripheral countries to bring them back to something like where they were before this great inflow of capital took place. Um, I guess there was a view that if only you had sufficient flexibility in labor markets that that could be done, that we could make that happen. We've learned two things, two things that I, that that, uh, that one should have suspected before, but are now really confirmed. Uh, one of them is that nobody has that much flexibility. I thought we knew that, but it, apparently that wasn't widely accepted uh, until, until the crisis hit. And some people are still uh, not accepting it. But the, the reality is that even countries that have what are widely praised as being highly flexible labor markets do not easily cut wages. It just doesn't happen. Nobody does that. You can, um, if you look at some of the stories you'll hear, there will be people telling you, well, pointing to big wage cuts here and there, uh, Latvia, whatever. Almost always those turn out to be big cuts in the wages of public sector employees. Private sector wages creep down slowly, uh, even in the face of, of very high unemployment. Um, uh, Ireland. Um, Ireland. Not that long ago, Ireland was a paragon, not just of fiscal responsibility, but of, of flexibility. People talked about how, how wonderful it was. Uh, George Osborne uh, called it a shining example of the, of the, uh, uh, of the extent of the possible in, in long-term policy making. Um, and it was supposed to be really adjust. And in the face of 14% unemployment, Ireland had several years of 14% unemployment, Ireland has managed to get its wages down by, uh, by a few percent. Very, very, very slow process. Grind, grinding wage deflation is, is all that you get, even in the most flexible economies. And by the way, this was true the United States. Um, we've, we've had a lot of, long ago, back, back when we were discussing the, whether the proposed single European currency was a good idea, um, uh, uh, Olivier Blanchard and Larry Katz looked at regional um, regional adjustment in the United States and found out that wage flexibility was a very small part of that. That it was mostly, it was actually mostly people moving. So it turns out that Europe doesn't have a good adjustment mechanism when stuff goes wrong. Um, so uh, diversion into the question of um, uh, when does it actually make sense to have a single currency? So it turns out that the, I guess not in, in the international macro area, but not so much, I don't know for how, how widely it's, it's known. We do have a theory, it's kind of a loose jointed theory, we do have a theory of optimum currency areas, uh, which is more like a checklist of things to look for that, that under which your, your currency might make sense. Um, and there are, 
there are two, uh, I'd say two principal strands, uh, Mundell and Kennan. So uh, Robert Mundell and our own Peter Kennan. Uh, the Mundell argument was that, um, that you really shouldn't have a single currency unless you have high mobility of labor. So that if you have asymmetric shocks, if, if, uh, if for whatever reason you have a boom in one place and a slump in another, uh, if workers move freely from the, the place that's slumping to the place that's booming, then, then it's going to be relatively easy to make the currency work. Uh, and if not, not. So you should be looking for, for that high mobility of labor. Um, the, uh, the Kennan uh, argument was that you really need fiscal integration, that you need a situation in which there's uh, some automatic transfers from the booming to the, to the slumping parts of your currency area. Um, both of these clearly have some truth to them. And both of them, by the way, suggested 20 years ago that maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Because uh, you looked at Europe, and no one can quantify all of this stuff, but you can certainly look at the Europe-US comparison. And it was obvious right away that labor mobility was not comparable to the United States and was not likely to become so in the foreseeable future. Um, cultural differences, uh, language barriers, um, it, was, it was just obvious. And it was, what was striking actually was that even within European countries, labor mobility tends to be quite low. Geographic mobility of labor tends to be quite low. Um, they, the, the, uh, the, um, um, I always thought an interesting role model for the future Euro um, in, was actually the nation of Switzerland, where it turns out that there's virtually no labor mobility between Francophone and German-speaking Switzerland. And so how could you expect there to be high labor mobility within, uh, within the European Union? Um, but then also fiscal integration. Um, I said that Ireland and Nevada are near, they are actually quite similar in terms of the size of the housing bubble, the unemployment rate once the bubble burst, quite, quite close parallel. They have roughly similar populations. Again, one of them has, actually has water and the other doesn't. But aside from that, it's a, um, but while times are miserable in Nevada, um, it's not a crisis on the same scale. And the reason is health care for the retirees is paid for from Washington. Retirement for the retirees is paid for from Washington. And a substantial part of the bank losses, or a substantial part of the losses on, on mortgage lending is, is falling on Fannie and Freddie. So there's a, there is an effect. Uh, without any policy decision, um, Nevada is receiving a level of transfers from uh, from. Uh, from less hard-hit parts of the United States on a scale that none of the European peripheral countries uh, uh, could, could dream of, of receiving. Um, helps, it basically helps to have a nation with, with a fair bit of fiscal federalism. Uh, we don't have um, enough to have avoided significant austerity cutbacks at, at the state and local level, but nothing like the European situation. Um, at least as I read it, the way that it's, it's actually played out, um, it is basically that uh, that that Kennan has trumped Mundell, that uh, that that the Princeton version has has sort of uh, beaten the, the Canadian version. Uh, that the uh, um, not not that not that the labor mobility isn't an issue, but that the clear and, and present uh, source of, of of extreme stress has been the lack of fiscal integration, and and that that was has made it extremely uh, difficult. Um, for for uh, for Europe to deal with this with this shock. Also, by the way, when we had the discussions, there was a lot of there, there was a, a lot of good economics done in the early 90s over the discussion of, of possible monetary union. Uh, the problem was most of the good economics led you to be highly skeptical about whether it was a good idea, and that was all ignored. So um, I, I was told that this, I, this, is, this is hearsay. I was told by people who, were, who worked on the, the report One Market, One Money that the European Commission prepared in 1990 that, uh, uh, that they were initially asked to prepare a report on the costs and benefits of, of a single currency. And after some draft pieces of chapters were prepared, um, they were told to prepare a report on the benefits of a single currency. 
uh, that, uh, that it, and I sort of understand why. The, the, the appeal, the romance the, of, of the single currency, the idea that this was a step towards a true, true political union for Europe was, was very strong. People did not want to hear about it. And there was a widespread, um, there were many assertions to the effect that because we would have sound policies, uh, there would not, in fact, be large asymmetric shocks. That turns out, of course, not to be true. And in, fact, in fact, we face the, the mother of all asymmetric shocks, something that was larger than even the pessimists imagined could happen. Because of the, uh, because of the, um, uh, of the collapse of, of capital flows to southern Europe, um, you had both severe recessions and, uh, and fiscal crises. Uh, the fiscal crisis is, for the most part, a consequence, not a cause, of, of the underlying problems. Uh, but that doesn't mean it isn't real. And um, um, there was, uh, right, the, the revenue collapsed. Countries that had been relatively sound began to move into large deficit. Um, and also, investors looked at the prospects and lost, lost faith in eventual repayment. Um, the, for the, to a large extent, the loss of private capital flows has been made up with official flows, through, uh, both, both through um, explicit programs from the Troika and, and through uh, ECB financing. Um, the condition for all of that has been austerity. And um, so as I said, there, there, there are, it's been extremely frustrating. The, the discussion of the crisis and its origins has latched onto the notion that fiscal irresponsibility caused it, despite overwhelming, it's, you know, all you need to do is just look at those Spanish numbers, and it's just not true. Um, but maybe the history expansionary, that you would cut spending, that would improve confidence, and that that would outweigh any direct drag on the economies affected. Um, this was based on some extremely uh, questionable, not, not, not questionable because it was, it was deliberately misleading, but, but very, very questionable in, in, on close inspection interpretations of, of, of historical episodes. Uh, basically, all of the alleged cases of expansionary austerity uh, in the past melted away when you looked at them hard. They all, either, either they weren't really expansionary or they involved something that wasn't on the table in, in Europe, like a, uh, like a devaluation or a sharp cut in, 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 uh, in long-term interest rates, which were just not going to be possible. Um, well, now the results are in. Um, this is not a perfect, oh, I should say, uh, evidence on fiscal policy. For the most part, right, so we have econometrics, which I think one of, my one of the things I've learned in my career is that in the end, sophisticated econometrics never convinces anyone of anything. Uh, that the only things that actually possibly move a, a, uh, opinion are very clear-cut natural experiments where you get something that's really dramatic that happens and then people can, can, can look at the results. And then, so most of what we used to know about fiscal policy came actually from wars and their aftermath because that's the only time you got really big changes in government spending. Uh, but now, in addition to, to wars um, as a natural experiment, we also have pestilence. Um, so, uh, well, not really, but we have is, is dramatic cuts. No, we don't have stimulus, but we have dramatic cuts forced um, as part of austerity programs. Um, this is from fourth quarter 2007 to fourth quarter 2011. And it's a, uh, um, the horizontal axis is the change in real government purchases uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a share of start date GDP. Um, and the, the vertical axis is the actual change in real GDP. Now it's not a clean experiment because uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, there have been changes in taxes and transfers as well, and I can't capture those in this picture. Uh, the other is there may be some reverse co correlation, uh, reverse causation, that uh, countries in trouble may be forced into austerity. But still, if you had believed the doctrines of austerity as they were being preached, let's say, in, in, uh, in ECB reports in, uh, in May or, uh, or June of, of 2010, and uh, you would not have expected to see this picture. Uh, what you see instead is, um, is extreme, extreme uh, contraction as a result of, of, of fiscal austerity. It says something 
about the state of the debate within Europe that Latvia is held up as a role model, right? Hey, look at that. They, they really they did great stuff with that 17% uh, decline in, in real GDP. Well, they, they have managed to restore access to markets, largely be, financial markets, largely because they didn't have very much debt to begin with, hardly any. Um, but, uh, boy, um, uh, I guess that, that, a, few, a, few more, uh, a few more success stories like that, and, and you'll be back to the, to, to, uh, to the Middle Ages. Um, okay. Um, now what? The question you, and let me say, I, something I, I think other people probably encounter, you try to talk about the difficulties of Europe and you get accused of being anti-European, um, which is not at all where I come from. This is, right, you, you're, you, Europe is a, is a noble experiment. Uh, it's something that we really, really want to succeed. If you care about, I mean, because it stands for a lot more than just, you know, more efficient economic organization. It's, it's about peace and democracy. And the, the whole European project is, is something that you very much want to succeed. And, um, but now it's, it's in, in dire, dire trouble. Um, on the current course, it's not going to, it, 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 the current course basically heads for, for catastrophe. Um, because what's being asked of the countries in trouble is not possible. Uh, they're being asked to restore competitiveness through grinding wage deflation, which means years of high unemployment. Um, the deflation means that the debt burden, which in the case of, of Spain um, is, the public debt burden is significant, but the private debt burden is, is even bigger, is actually going to grow. So you're condemning them to debt deflation. And um, you just think about that. You're thinking about 24% unemployment, 50% youth unemployment, year after year. That's, that, that is not going to happen. Um, and, uh, and shouldn't happen. That's, that's an impossible situation. Um, can the euro break up? There was an interesting discussion. I, I was persuaded initially by Barry Eichengreen that it could not. If you asked me three years ago, I thought it could not because the argument was any government that so much as breathed a hint that it might think of leaving the euro um, would unleash an enormous run on its banks, precipitate a massive banking crisis. And so there was, in effect, a poison pill that kept you from leaving. Turns out that there, I think the right way to think about this is to think about Argentina. Uh, the Argentine convertibility law, which fixed one peso, one dollar, between 1991 and, and 2001, um, and, and more or less uh, said that they couldn't print pesos, that, that uh, they could only issue pesos in return for, for, for foreign exchange that was brought in. A currency board system was supposed to be unbreakable, irreversible, for the same reason, that any hint of a change would precipitate a banking crisis. What actually happened was they had the banking crisis anyway. For a banking crisis first, and after the banks were closed, uh, with only a trickle of fund withdrawals uh, allowed, uh, that's when that's when they threw in the towel and 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 abandoned the, the the peg. Now it's even harder for a European country, but not in the end logistically impossible. Just something you, they really don't want to do. Um, but you can you can see the story quite easily. It's uh, the uh, I mean there is an eff in effect a run on the Greek banks already, but it's a slow motion run, and and loans from the ECB are, are preventing collapse. But either it accelerates, or the ECB has had enough, or whatever, um, and we're in, in in that kind of situation. And and the currency gets overstamped with stamps that, that say this is not a this is not a euro. This is a new drachma, and uh, and it can happen. Um, and if it happens, I would, I would say that it's more likely than not for Greece. You just look at, e even, on, even if you believe the projections in the, in, in the latest um, Troika agreement with Greece, they look impossible, and, and you shouldn't believe them either. So, and then does that lead to domino effects? If one country leaves, uh, what happens next? It's, it's, quite, it's, it's alarmingly easy to see how the whole thing breaks up. So how do you make it survive? Because even if it was a mistake, you would really like to avoid having, stepping back here. Uh, partly because the, the, a breakup of the euro would be extremely disruptive. Um, 
in the end, you'd get past that, but, but you know, in the long run, you could, you could make Europe work again with separate currencies, but in the long run, we we're all dead and all that. Um, the, uh, you really, the transition costs could be very severe, but also the, the, the political defeat would be enormous. The, to have Europe's greatest project on the, on the road to a unified Europe turn into a debacle um, is not really what you want to see. So what would it take to make it work? Um, and say that, that really the main thing that, that you need is, uh, because it's so difficult to cut wages, um, you need a situation in which, in which wage cuts either aren't needed or, or need be much smaller. Um, which comes down to saying if you had, if we expected um, three or four percent inflation for the euro area over the next five years, if we expected four percent inflation, this would look vastly easier. Uh, the adjustment problem for Spain would be significantly smaller. Um, the debt burdens would look significantly less crushing. So if you had, went and had a, a, a I mean, that, I, there's a, we, we have a, the case for a higher inflation target is actually reasonably strong even for the United States. Um, and the case in general that inflation, a little bit of inflation is good on both the demand and the supply side is reasonably strong because that wage rigidity is, is, is a feature here as well. You can actually see there's been a spike in the number of workers getting precisely zero wage increases in the United States, which is an indication that, that, that wage rigidity is really binding now. Um, but um, Europe has those problems um, on a much greater scale. In a way, you can say that, that lacking the other preconditions, lacking the high labor mobility and above all the fiscal integration, um, Europe really needs a, a higher inflation rate to, to, uh, to make it, it work. Um, well, we know what the reaction will be from, from, the, from the European core. And it's, uh, it, it's a, a wildly, wildly, it, almost unmentionable policy. Uh, and there is this collision in Europe now between the irresistible force and the immovable object. The thing as set up cannot work, but the solutions seem to be impossible. And uh, now maybe there's a, there's a way to make that happen, to, 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 to get past all of that. Uh, I have to say that, my, uh, that Mario Draghi has turned out to be a, uh, a cleverer person, uh, a more subtle um, and, and, and better leader than at first we thought. And we were, there was, there was an acute financial crisis in Europe in, in, in late fall last year uh, that threatened to just blow the whole thing apart in, in, in a matter of weeks. Um, and it was clear that what was really needed was for the ECB to step in and buy the bonds of, of the uh, crisis countries, and, which was a wildly unpopular notion. And, and so Draghi said, no, we will never under any circumstances do that. We will, however, lend unlimited amounts to banks with, with uh, and accepting sovereign debt as security, um, as collateral. So, uh, so cl clever fellow. Um, but, but it takes something more than that and something much more obvious and more sustained to make this thing work. Um, I don't know what happens. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult outlook. Um, so it's, it's funny. I, I, uh, I think Martin Wolf and I are, are, are batting forth in the op-ed op -ed pages on, on these issues. And Martin, maybe he wasn't feeling well, because he actually had a relatively optimistic column a couple of days ago. That's, a, that's about as rare for him as it is for me, in which he basically said he offered no, no evidence that, that, that anyone was prepared to do the right thing, but just said that in the end, European elites will not allow this project to fail. I hope he's right, but uh, wow. And who, who would have imagined that we could screw up this badly? Questions, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to handle it. Small room, friendly crowd. Yeah. Um, actually, I think since they're taping this, actually, people should probably head for these mics that are in the middle. So if you have a question, you might want to ask, right, am, I, am I right about that? Yeah, yeah sorry, I'm just thinking, I, we didn't think. This is casual. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for uh, taking time to come here. Um, you've done a lot of traveling the past few days. 
Uh, but so the trip here was, was uh, taking the elevator down uh, from the fourth floor, so that wasn't so bad. But uh, at the end of your talk, you touched upon an item of interest with the ECB's long-term refinancing operations. Yep. And I would just be interested to hear, though you don't know what will happen, your predictions. People are expecting maybe a crunch in three years when they come due. Um, increased inflation. And just be interested to hear uh, your opinion on that subject. Well, if, if Europe is, it has actually gotten to a strategy that makes this feasible, there won't be a crunch in three years because, uh, because everyone will have started to believe that, that European sovereigns will be able to pay their debts. Not Greece, but the rest. And, uh, um, and the inflation, um, first of all, some inflation would be a good thing. Well, it would really be, be helpful. Um, but the, this, is, this is something that, that's both sides of the Atlantic. People talk about the Fed also as if, as if the central bank um, cannot somehow that those, those balance sheets will turn into explosive inflationary pressures once the economy recovers. I don't see any reason on either side to believe that that's true. It's quite easy um, for central banks to tighten. They can, uh, even if they can't necessarily divest themselves of all those assets uh, in a short period of time, they, there are lots of other things they can do. They can, they can raise policy rates. They can, uh, on this side of the Atlantic, you can raise the interest rate on, on reserves. So I, I, don't, I don't see any, any risk there. I mean, I, the, there is an issue that the, that the ECB may take a paper loss on, on some of what it's doing, um, which ought not to matter at all. But again, this problem of, of a, a currency without a, without a country arises. The Fed is clearly, uh, we, we know who the Fed turns to if it, takes a, if it has a loss on its balance sheet, which it just, it just um, goes down, down the road to the, to the Treasury. Um, exactly who, who takes responsibility for keeping the ECB solvent is not entirely clear. But, but uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think that, that actually, uh, this, is, this has been characteristic of everything in this crisis. We spend a lot of time worrying about hypothetical risks that are not actually happening, and r remarkably little time worrying about the actual ongoing disaster that we're actually experiencing. You know, the, the notion that, that we might have to worry three years from now about possible inflationary impacts of, of the ECB's expanded balance sheet, which I don't think is, is even going to happen, but even if you did, boy, uh, if this is, uh, I think we, what, what you really should be worried about is, is the euro as a, as a project going to survive those, those three years? Thank you. Um, I've um, heard a lot of people uh, present on the difficulty of solving the Eurozone crisis and not clear what the solution is or whether or not there's enough consensus to be able to craft or, and get behind a solution. So let's, uh, let's take it a different way. Let's assume it blows up in some respect. As uh, Greece leaves or Euro, the Euro... Yeah breaks apart. So my question is this. How consequential to the real economy and standards of living and social contract to Europe would such a, an event be? And how consequential would it be to the United States and the rest of the world's economies? Okay. Yeah. So, um, start, start from, from the way things would look after, after the, the dust settles. Um, would the European economy suffer a crippling blow if it reverted to, to a set of independent currencies? And the answer pretty clearly is not. I mean, it had a set of, of independent currencies uh, not that long ago. There were some transactions costs involved in that, some uncertainties created by that, but, but the notion that it was unworkable um, it, it's, it requires that, that you forget uh, things that are, are still quite fresh in living memory. Or for that matter, if you want to ask, how can you have a tightly integrated continental economy um, with, a, with fluctuating exchange rates in the middle of it? Um, there's, there's this country up there called Canada, um, and it doesn't seem to me to be in, in a state of dire um, disarray. Um, and, uh, and, and Canada is, is very much the, the illustration that you can have, you know, Canada 
um, is uh, is smaller in population than than than, uh, than the European Big Four. Uh, and if you look at the geography of Canada, it's basically closer to the United States than it is to itself. And so it's uh, um, it's and yet it manages to function with an independent currency. So you can do that. Now the the, the transition is a mess because you have now a, a web of debts and, um, and there'd be a legal morass. There is no provision for, for what those debts become. Uh, and they're not just public debts, they're private debts. And, and who knows uh, how, how you resolve all of that. So the transition could be very difficult. Argentine situation, um, there was about a year and a half, only about a year and a half of, of, uh, of severe economic disruption. And then, and then a recovery, but there are, and so that I think is, is a reason to think that that uh, that belief that it's a it, that it's a really really prolonged process of disruption is probably wrong, but but there are some ways in which Argentina you know, things would be different, and particularly when we think about Greece, uh, we think a, a Greece a Greek exit from the euro and the replacement of the euro with the new drachma, which then devalues drastically. Uh, it's supposed to produce an export boom, but what is Greece going to export? Uh, well, largely, a lot of it's going to be tourism, and a, uh, a chao the chaotic aftermath of the breakup of a currency union is probably not an ideal environment for tourists. Uh, uh, for, not impossible, right? You can insulate, right? But you've got to think of you're going to have a lot of package tours of, of, of Germans and, and Brits heading for Greek islands and being reassured that they will come nowhere near the stuff that's actually going on in Athens, and it's going to be a little difficult. So, so it, it's, it's going to be ugly. But, I mean, if we can get... To, we could find ourselves seven years down the road with a perfectly reasonably functioning European economy, but with the biggest project, the biggest piece of the European project, the, the most adventurous thing, having failed utterly. And that's, that's really bad for, for a wide range of things. I mean, it, it, there, is a, there is a political component. You really, the failure will hurt very badly, and that, would, that will resonate down, down, down the decades. When you say the failure will hurt, from a political standpoint, are you referring to things like what Holman Cole, Cole said, that if the euro fails, we go back to war? I mean, what are you referring to? You no, know, you want to avoid Godwin's law violations here. Um, people uh, do internet know that, right? If the original Godwin's law was that any, any sufficiently long discussion thread um, ends up with, with people uh, referring to Hitler. Um, and so, uh, um, so you don't... It, it's, it's hard to, to... But look, the economic distress and... Look, the euro was supposed to serve as a unifying and, and instead it's produced a situation where there's intense um, hostility from both sides, right? The, uh, uh, with, with Germany considering the Southern Europeans... Uh, Spe irresponsible spendthrifts and the southern Europeans considering the Germans uh, um, brutal taskmasters and, and some truth in both views and um, so this is not good and, and you can see look um, so uh, uh, our colleague uh, Kim Shapley has been doing remarkable work on, on events in Hungary which is, has got some scary political developments going on. And clearly, although Hungary's not in the euro, it's, it's the Hungarian economic crisis, which is related to all of this, is, is an important factor in all of that. So, yeah, I mean, you don't have to, don't want to get too melodramatic, but, um, uh, but, but, but a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the peace and democracy that was the whole point uh, will, will be at least, at least, um, um, lose some of its lose some of its force. It it's it can it can degrade the whole s situation. Okay, okay. Uh, Professor Krugman, my question has to do with the election the, or the what it looks like the probable election of um, Monsieur Francois Hollande yeah. as the next chief executive of France. Is that would you be willing to venture some comments if he were confirm as the new president of France a little over two weeks from now? Yeah, uh, whether. You know, the impact, both in terms of the kind of thinking that go goes on in Europe, as well as the actual policies that may be implemented. Okay, I know nothing about Alant, um, so I have nothing. I guess I'm probably 
fantasizing, but I'd like to hope that that uh, that it will actually that 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 uh, an Hollande election will spur some some flexibility. I mean, right now the the, the way uh, the way European leaders have responded to the crisis is is just by doubling down at each stage, doubling down on the same policies that failed. The pre, you know, each, every six months, they double down on the same policies that failed in the previous six months. So every time you see uh, that austerity is leading to a deepening slump, the answer is more austerity. And uh, um, which isn't to say that the alternatives are easy, but, but at some point, you have to say, wait, this is, this is not a, a, a workable strategy. And if we no longer have a, a completely reliable um, Franco-German alliance to to uh, impose these policies, then then maybe maybe you get a chance to to rethink the position. Uh, so that that's a pretty weak right. That's saying uh, um, you know, might hope that he's elected because we don't know what he he will do, and and something something different is uh, might be better than what's happening now. Uh, that's that's a hell of a way to to say you're the, to to call for for a politician to take leadership. But and there is a little bit. Uh, uh, that's 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 a yes minister. Uh, 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 we must do something. This is something. Therefore, we must do it. There's a little bit of that, but anyway. Uh, but that's that. But but I, I'm I'm certainly not. The the fact that 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 uh, if Sarkozy is booted, that it would be taken as a blow to the current European economic strategy. That's a good thing because the current strategy is not working. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about, uh, to use your phrase, uh, hypothetical risks that don't happen. Um, so Jurgen Stark said uh, that if Greece defaulted, it would be a Lehman-like disaster. Uh, and then uh, sorry, what like? Uh, sorry, a what? Uh, I, not, a uh, what? I didn't catch the the uh, the adjective. Lehman-like disaster. Oh, yeah. um, and then they did default to a certain extent, and it wasn't that big a deal. Um, so I was wondering uh, whether Italy, which has 120% debt to GDP ratio and growth exceeding only Haiti and Zimbabwe over the last three decades, should default. Uh, your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think. I mean, actually, Italy is a closer. Uh, one of one of the arguments has been that that default starts to look attractive if you actually have a primary surplus, um, so that you're you're actually you're you're borrowing only to, only to pay interest on, on the, the debt you already have. And Italy does have a primary surplus, uh, unlike Greece, though it's getting there. And, uh, but, but the disruption would be large. And, and Italy, Italy is, it, the real Italian economy, although it's, it's depressing and depressed, is nothing like. I mean, it, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a disaster area on the same scale that, that, um, that Greece is, or, or even Spain. Youth unemployment is very high, and it's, that's disturbing. But it's, I, I would say that Italy is not uh, in the same desperation. Uh, so you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't urge it. And, by, and, and in general, by the way, there, I have a lot of sympathy for the leaders of, these, of the troubled countries. Because even if you believe that it's not going to work, even if you believe that in the end, um, even if you believe that, that, that Greece is, is in the end. It's never going to. It, it's going to have to leave the euro. Um, the prime minister of Greece can't move on that until it's absolutely. There are absolutely no alternatives left. Uh, again, Argentina. They, uh, by by the summer of two thousand one, they knew. They knew it wasn't going to work. But they were just. They, you could not be the person to make that happen. Do you think default absolutely means leaving the, the no, currency no, union? No, no. The default. That's very different. I mean. Greece has now defaulted, but hasn't left the euro. No, those are very different. But the trouble is, the trouble is that the, since the f fundamental problem is balance of payments and overvaluation, default doesn't solve that problem. So the uh, so the, I, I think you always want to step back. Ultimately, this is not a debt problem. It's not a public debt problem. This is a problem of of costs and prices out of line, of of capital flows that that. Uh, that have dried up and and uh, forcing forcing a balance of payments adjustment and the question is how are you going to do that and it's it, so it is ultimately a question of of, of currency uh, rather than than of debt default doesn't solve the problem thank you
Professor Krugman, to think a little bit outside the box. In the 1990s, uh, Bob Gordon at Northwestern and Bill Lewis at the Global McKinsey Institute yeah. in Washington did a lot of work, as you know, on productivity and deregulation. Yeah. One of the findings, as I recall it, was that the growth rate of continental Europe could be doubled merely by microeconomic deregulation of the product and the labor markets. Now, is it possible that if we're going to be stuck with, quote, austerity, something like this, which apparently does not depend, is not sensitive on the state of the business cycle, were it to be possible, could that not help Europe's future? By the way, I'd be shocked if, if Bob Gordon said it could be doubled. Uh, that doesn't sound, maybe, may but it was a group sound... of people, but they were finding the impact was much greater than people had thought. Um, and it, I know it's politically difficult, but is it not something people like yourself could mention or suggest? Okay, two. All right, I guess I'm, I'm skeptical. A structural reform is always a good thing if it's an appropriate reform, but, but to pin your hopes on it, I think, is, 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 probably, um, is, is probably a mistake. Um, and so I, I, and you really need to be careful. By the way, you may, you really need to be careful about about interpreting what you see. Also, if you, you may recall that uh, last fall Ireland was being trumpeted as a success story, and that was partly because there was a little bit of an uptick in GDP, which then went away. But but also because unit labor costs appeared to have fallen sharply, um, because of a sharp rise in productivity. And it wasn't actually. It was. It was basically an statistical illusion, right? The uh, basically the the uh, everything had collapsed except the pharma sector, which has essentially employs no people and and has large value added per person it does employ. And it was it wasn't it wasn't really happening. So you need to be structural stuff is 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 always suspect. Um, the um, and at least as I read the Bob Gordon stuff, the, the Europe did lag behind on, on the productivity acceleration that took place in the United States. But a lot of that was in the service sector. I mean, if you want, it was, it was very much, uh, if you want, it, not too much of a caricature. It was basically that we were quicker to, to, uh, to adopt big box retail, which is fine, but doesn't have much to do with the competitiveness issues that are, are relevant here. Uh, what you need is what you need is tradable sectors, and I don't know that that anyone has been suggesting that that European tradable, tradable sectors can achieve a vast productivity explosion through any structural reforms that are on the table. German ministers have mentioned to me that the they attribute a lot of their success in the last 15 years to their structural deregulation of the labor market and stuff. I mean, is that a suggestion? There's hope here. It's not necessarily wrong, but I would have said that. I mean, Germany has always been remarkably good at exporting, even with, with costs that appear extremely high. Um, and Western Germany um, had relatively low unemployment uh, for a long, long time, even, even at a time that was before the reform. So I, I mean, it may be true, but I would have, I would have thought that the, I mean, and that there was a long period, you know, Germany actually did have a, uh, a sustained period of relative relative deflation as well, yeah. which was achieved, um, but was achieved the good way, not so much by actual deflation in Germany as through inflation in the peripheral countries. And um, you know, in a way, what I'm saying is that to make this thing work now, um, you now need to run that same process, but with the roles reversed. Well, thank you. So oh. yeah. we talked about earlier uh, when looking at the LTRO, how, you know, essentially it was a backdoor way for the ECB to buy government bonds. Uh, what is really the difference then? If, if the market knows that another LTRO is a possibility, what is the difference between having, you know, an LTRO be an implicit possibility and having a firewall aside from having it subsidized by the IMF and, and other countries? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, I, I, I don't really see, uh, I don't see the firewall as the issue now. And this is, uh, again, this is one of the misconceptions. It was viewed as a liquidity problem, that what we needed to do was stem the panic. And, and occasionally, you did need to do that. So certainly, November, November um, 2011 did look like you know, we really were, were wondering whether the, thing would, whether the uh, European system would last out the week for, for a point. There was a point there. But, it, but, but that only buys you some time. And yeah, and, and the, the whole. 
Uh, why is the IMF involved here? It's, a, it's, actually, it's, it's actually a question worth asking, right? It's not, Europe has the resources to, to, to bail itself out, it's, so it's a question of internal distribution. Well, it doesn't need political. external money. What, sorry? Part of it could be political will. And well, and, and, and someone else, I think there's a little bit of the classic IMF role has been, um, has been you know, in developing countries forever. That the IMF is someone who who acts as basically a, a an absorber of, of all the hatred. You know, government officials impose the austerity they they know they need to impose, but they can blame the IMF. And uh, so there's some of that. And, and particularly in this case, if, if it's going to be, you know, if the troika is essentially Berlin and Frankfurt and and the IMF, um, one of these is not the same as the other two, at least at least in appearance. And, and that's kind of useful. But um, but that's that's about it. And it's and it's yeah it doesn't really and the IMF is now uh, you know they're they're the um, they're uh, they're they're the doves in all of this uh, they're the ones who are advocating um, looser monetary policies they've been improving I I went I went to you know the the one actual like more or less genuine success story uh, in crisis is 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 Iceland. Uh, which is, unfortunately, has forgot about the population of Somerville, Massachusetts. But it's, uh, but it, uh, and the IMF in Iceland. I went to a conference there, and they, boy, they're 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 cuddly, they're they're you know they're lovable people. It's a, this is not the old IMF, but uh, but the IMF is. So I, the only thing about the IMF, they're actually, I think, acting as a ameliorative force on, on some of the harshness. But 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 it, you really should the European Europeans should really be asking themselves why. What does this say about us that, that inter for what is essentially an eternal matter, we're having to call on a Washington-based institution to provide a front? Yeah. Hi, uh, a second question. Uh, you say, um, as we all know, there was an acute crisis last fall in the Eurozone banking system. Um, can you, uh, and I, I take it to mean that you, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a, a bank run was imminent. Uh, can you confirm or deny that a, a bank run was imminent and explain also how the Eltro saved that off? Well, it wasn't, not sure that there was a bank run in, on deposits that was imminent. But, you know, the European banking system has become heavily dependent on, on uh, large parts of it are dependent on wholesale financing. Um, so it, it's, like, it's like here, we never had a bank run. Barely, uh, you know, we didn't have runs. There were no scenes out of It's a Wonderful Life in the United States. But what you had was a collapse of repo. Um, and the Europeans don't actually have shadow banking uh, to the same extent we do, although I guess uh, um, uh, 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 Professor Shin tells us that the, that the U.S. shadow banking system is actually run largely through European banks. But, but it wasn't so much American-style shadow banking um, as, as it was just heavy reliance on wholesale financing. So if you look at Spain, um, if you ask, uh, uh, you know, who financed that housing bubble, uh, how did that happen, uh, a large part of it is, in fact, uh, interbank lending within Europe, basically, uh, if you like, you know, caricaturing, but it's not too far off, that, that Landesbanken lending lots of money to, to, to Cajas. And, uh, and, and when that's cut off, all hell breaks loose. And so that's, that was the issue. But uh, the ultra specifically, since the ECB uh, has traditionally been a lender of last resort to banks and was doing that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, long before last fall, how did the ultra specifically stave off uh, a repo crisis? Because by making it the loans contingent on uh, sovereign debt as collateral, the banks in effect had to buy the sovereign debt. And because what you were looking at was, was, was um, Collapse in, in the in the prices of the sovereign debt, and so the LTRO propped up those prices, and and that's what brought the crisis to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So, I guess we're uh, on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to all of you, and thanks especially to Paul.